Executive Director of the State Association of Fire Chiefs. It's our pleasure to have you here this morning. We're here this morning to discuss a very important topic regarding firefighter behavior health. The issues of PTSD, substance abuse, treatment issues, all the issues that are affecting the fire service throughout New York State and the nation. We're pleased this morning to have with us a couple of speakers, one of whom many of you know, Chief Mike Healy of the Central Niagara Fire Department, is a certified employee assistance professional, a substance abuse professional. He's a member of the Rockland County, New York Critical Incident Stress Team. Mike is a 46-year member of the Volunteer Fire Service and current and past chief. He retired as clinical director of the NYCTA, Transportation Workers Union Assistance Program, which served 36,000 members in 2008. He served with NYCTA for 28 years. Mike is currently the coordinator of fire education at Rockland County Training Center, as well as a New York State fire instructor. He also serves on the fire education committee of the New York State Association of Fire Chiefs. His co-presenter this morning is Scott Geisehart, a 20-year, 21-year member of the Frazee, Minnesota Fire Department. For years, Scott was getting short-tempered, angry, and verbally abusive. He was having nightmares every night. Life got to be so bad that Scott locked himself into a shop with his gun in a single misfire moment, got a second chance at life. Scott believes divine intervention saved his life that day and was determined to find out why. He searched the internet after the suicide and attempt to find assistance and answers. He found them. I had PTSD and I didn't even realize it. My symptoms were right there, Scott said. He'll share his journey through the years of confusion and the incredible transformation and recovery into post-traumatic success. Please welcome Mike Healy and Scott Geiselhart. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, when we do these being that we're talking about firefighter behavioral health, which years ago I, I laughed at just the sound of it, but uh, when we do these things, we don't know whether there's going to be two people in the audience or 200 people in the audience. And I'm really glad to see that that as many of you showed up this morning as, as you did. Uh, and I'm humbled by, by uh, Scott and I are humbled at being uh, offered this opportunity to get the message out. Uh, we have, as, as Jerry said, a lot of you, I know a lot of the people sitting out there, and I've done the seminar series on Flyer Shogra, and I've been around the state, and I've worked with the hands-on. And uh, some of you probably didn't know that, uh, that I was in this field, that uh, 29 years ago, uh, I identified a problem with myself, and I, I had somewhere to reach out to. And, uh, and we started, uh, I started on a path, and it, and it turns out to be a journey to be where I'm standing here today. Um, the Firefighter Behavioral Health 2017 program is a two hour program that I'm gonna give you, as Scott and I are gonna give you in an hour. Uh, and I'm, I, you know, a couple of people have already said, we wish you could do that with all your classes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Share the Load program, on the right over here is, is something that, that uh, was developed with a friend of mine uh, because 29 years ago when I needed help through my union uh, and the New York City Transit Authority, I, I picked up a phone and I made a phone call and I had a program that had just been developed uh, to, to lend help to me and, and give me some direction as to where to go. When I retired, uh, I had had a friend in the, in the recovery business, uh, Mike Blackburn. Mike is a retired battalion chief of the Providence, Rhode Island Fire Department. I had known him for over 20 years. We had been in, a, in an organization together. And, uh, and I got together with him for a cup of coffee one morning. And I said, uh, what are we going to do for the firefighters in this country? that have nowhere to call. And uh, so Mike and I 
Joe Mike is on the Providence, Rhode Island State uh, Critical Incident Stress Team. He's, uh, and he's working with a company that has 12 rehabs. Because I want to do this on a national basis. Uh, so Mike and I, we have basically the same credentials. We sat down and we said, how are we going to do this on a national basis? Because we have to offer it to everybody. And I, I had retired from New York City and I said, maybe I'll donate a couple hours a week to this program to get this thing started. And, and uh, maybe we'll have something for firefighters. So naturally, it's completely taken over my life. And uh, the program is up and running and doing really well. At the bottom here, you'll see this number, 888-731-3473. Uh, it's the hotline, the national hotline for firefighters that any firefighter in this country can pick up the phone and call and get, speak to another firefighter on the phone. And if you call that number right now, and I know there's idiots out there from my department, don't call it now. <laughs> this, this phone rings. If I don't pick up this phone, it automatically goes to Mike's phone. And, uh, and he picks it up. Today we're going to talk about and identify the signs of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Something that's been boo-hooed through the fire service for years. I was part of it. Uh, you know, uh, come back from the fire. Uh, you get the gear cleaned up, get the rigs back in order. Uh, and as we all know, maybe sit around, have a couple beers afterwards, and uh, we're back in shape. Um, nobody sees, you know, there were three incidents yesterday in this world. Uh, a terrible uh, inferno in, in West London that killed up to the last time I checked 17 people. Uh, a terrible shooting in Alexandria, Virginia, and a terrible shooting in San Francisco. Who was at every one of those incidents? The fire department. Naturally the police, but the fire department. Our mission over the years has changed. Uh, we've gotten big into the EMS, uh, into the EMS world. And we're always the ones running towards what everybody else is running against, uh, away from. So over the years, things happen. We see different things occur. And we push it down, and we push it down, and we push it down. And uh, things, symptoms start coming up. And PTSD is basically just a collection of symptoms. Anxiety, depression, anger is the number one tip off. Rage. Uh, flashbacks, sleepless nights, and these things start occurring and eventually we start to medicate. Either we go to a doctor and they medicate us or we start self-medicating, <coughs> alcohol, drugs, and uh, we'll discuss all of that as we go along today. To identify the signs of suicidal ideation. Uh, what's going on? What happened? All of a sudden, and I can say this today, that prior to 29 years ago, for at least a year before uh, I got help, every day I thought of killing myself. Every single day. And it's a tough way to wake up every morning, thinking there's nothing to live for. I had no idea about PTSD. I don't know whether it was PTSD, but I know one thing. I was full of rage, full of anger, and didn't think life was worth living. Uh, identify the signs of substance abuse. Uh, the last person that usually knows that they need help is the person that needs help. Uh, for years, uh, alcohol was my best friend, and I was terrified to live without it. Uh, I didn't want to think about it, I didn't want to talk about it. Uh, but eventually, uh, it will get you one way or the other. And now, of course, we want to be able to give you some place to get help when you need it. So the history of the Share the Load program is when Mike and I got together over that cup of coffee, I said, where are we going to start? And I said, Mike being a career firefighter, he said, well, what about the volunteers? I said, well, there's 750,000 volunteers in the, in, the, uh, in the United States. 
I said, they're all over. They have every type of insurance in the world. They're usually working people, uh, and they usually have, you know, well, they all have families uh, of some sort or another. So uh, we started there. We went to the National Volunteer Fire Council, who have been our partners in this. The National Volunteer Fire Council uh, vetted us and made sure that we were the real deal, checked on our credentials, and uh, we started in a partnership with them, and they came up with the Share the Load program. So we're going to talk about alcohol abuse in the fire service and the use of illegal and legal drugs. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. Every firefighter in this room has experienced a terrifying event. And you probably know which one I'm talking about right now. Uh, my particular one that I can remember like it was yesterday was when I was 19 years old. I was riding in the officer's seat of the first two engine to a, uh, a motor vehicle accident. Pulled up, it looked like it was a nothing deal. Uh, car was down in the ditch. Uh, I didn't realize that the entire side of the car that was down on the ditch side was, had been ripped off and that three local teenagers uh, had been absolutely mutilated in the, in the accident and killed. Uh, they were local basketball stars. They were traveling with their friends and family. They were going to meet them at the local diner. So all their friends, their girlfriends, and their families were at the scene. And uh, I can still, to this minute, hear the screams of the families when, we, when they were notified that their three, that their three children were, were dead. That was when I was 19. I'm 36 now. Yeah, I guess still <laughs> Symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, and severe anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. Uh, rage, anger. Uh, anger to the point that you yell at your kid, and 15 minutes later you say to yourself, the hell did I get so upset about this? It was really nothing. That type of deal. That's really the number one tip off. Uh, I brought with me today uh, a gentleman who called uh, the hotline. Uh, his, he's uh, a, uh, an ex-chief from the crazy Minnesota Fire Department. Uh, he's my friend. Uh, I've got to work with Scott since uh, July of 2014. Uh, I'm really glad he could make the trip. Uh, we've done this before. And uh, like I said, we're trying to give you a two-hour presentation in, in, an, in, a, uh, in an hour. But I think the most important part of today's presentation is listening <coughs> to Scott. And with that, I'll give you Assistant Chief Scott, uh, Scott Geiselhoff. Thank you. Thanks for having me in New York. This is pretty amazing. Um, my name is Scott Geiselhart. As Mike said, I uh, come from Frazee, Minnesota, a small, small town in Frazee, Minnesota. Um, it's about an hour east of Fargo, North Dakota. Don't judge me on that, please. Um, if you've seen the movie, it's probably the same producer that did the uh, fire scenes in Backdraft. Um, small department, 1,300 people in our town. About 20, uh, 28 firefighters, and uh, we cover a lot of uh, a lot of townships, a lot of outside rural area. Uh, we've got a school a town, and um, as a small community, and on the fire department, you re we recognize a lot of the people in the auto accidents, in the house fires, in the drownings. We we have tons of lakes up there in Minnesota where we're at, um, and. When I got in the fire department 21 years ago, we uh, decided to get the jaws of life and start running on calls because the neighboring town took, took about 15, 20 minutes for them to get through our town. So we realized that we could take some time off that golden hour. And we trained really hard and we got good. Um, put everything in a one ton truck, way, over, way overloaded it. Um, 
and we started going on some calls. And unfortunately, we got a, a lot of bad calls. A lot of kids, um, burnt up vehicles with people in them, drownings, ice water drownings. And, um, you know, I, I knew I was going to be seeing that stuff, and we all did. And I just kept telling myself, yeah, I didn't cause these accidents, I'm not causing this. I'm okay with this because I'm making it better. Well, I started to get angry. I started drinking a lot, way more than normal. And um, I started isolating myself. I started yelling at my kids, yelling at my girlfriend at the time. And it built and built and built and it got bad. I was not a mechanic by trade, owned my own shop. And I'd started to isolate myself down at the shop, working myself all the time, day and night. Um, about 10 years ago, I'd go to uh, concerts and things in the summertime or whatever with some friends, and um, they'd do a little math, so I'd do some math, you know, once a month maybe at the most. Just enough to keep up with them, you know, at night. And uh, they were doing it, so I did a couple lines. No big deal, I wasn't hooked or anything. Um, and then uh, in about 2000, in about 2000, um, 2010 actually, we had a bad vehicle accident, a rollover. It was a high school kid, rolled over in ice water in a pond. And we showed up and everything went perfect. He was underwater for 10 minutes. And we got him out and it was, it was picture perfect. Everything went perfect. And if we were, we were celebrating a victory because we got him back, they brought him to Fargo, they were warming his body up. Everything looked great. A month later, he passed away from a lung infection. I killed him. I was in the water, I was in the Gumby suit. I pulled his body out of that vehicle, I drug him through the water, and I blamed myself. I put something in his mouth, I told myself I killed that kid. I started to blame myself for every other fatality that happened in the car accidents and the house fires. I was jinxed, I was there, so it was my fault. I started getting into a real bad tailspin. And about the same time, I started doing a lot of meth. I started doing meth every day. I was getting so angry that every time I was around my kids, I'd yell at them. Every time I was around my ex-girlfriend, I'd yell at her. I was the nicest guy in the world to everybody. It was like a Jekyll and Hyde. I was running at my repair shop, a nice guy. But man, when I was behind closed doors or if I was around them, I'd take it out on them. I started drinking a whole lot. I started spending my days and nights, 23 hours down at the shop. My girlfriend left me, took my kids with, and it got to the point where I'd go home after work at seven o'clock, whatever, leave my car in the driveway and walk back down to my shop and have my lights on timers and my vehicle in parking lots. People would think that I was actually at home and I was down at the shop. I didn't want to be around anybody. I pulled away from the fire department, my friends. I went from assistant chief down to a captain, down to a firefighter in about six months time. In July 2012, or I'm sorry, in about 2012, it got to the point where the nightmares got so bad, I told myself I wasn't gonna to go to sleep until I was dead. I started doing a line of meth an hour minimum. I was buying it by the ounce there, delivered it right to my shop. I wanted to die. I couldn't handle the nightmares. I didn't want to close, I couldn't close my eyes. So every time I closed my eyes, I'd see my kids falling out of the sky on fire. Falling out of the sky on fire and drowning in front of me, and I couldn't do anything. I was paralyzed. But the earth's tool, the jaws wouldn't work, and I couldn't get to them. It was helpless, I was paralyzed. So I never wanted to close my eyes again until I was dead. In July 2014, after going over to my ex-girlfriend's apartment and yelling at my kids, I never physically heard about it, the words I said, I could not take those words back. I mean, I called them every name in the book, things I didn't deserve. I was the guy that didn't need to step on the Lego to get mad, I would get, I'd just get mad and blow up. I went over to the apartment and yelled at him. And I realized I was out of control. I figured I must have a split personality. Something's wrong with me. And I had to stop myself from hurting them. From, they deserve better. I figured I had to get myself out of their story. And I had to stop myself from hurting them. 
I went to my shop, sat down on my desk, reached in the drawer, pulled out my 44 Magnum revolver, put it to my head, and I squeezed the trigger, and it clicked. I chose that weapon because it was good to do the job. And when it didn't, I couldn't believe it. I slammed it down on the desk, and I was shaking. I was up on the desk behind me against the wall, shaking. And finally, I got, I got enough strength in me to get back off that desk and, and reach for the gun and unload it and flip the rounds out. I actually had to put a pen in the cylinder of the gun because when I went to lay it down, the cylinder wanted to close and I thought that empty gun was going to go off. I mean, I thought the bullet was in the barrel and something, something just it wasn't right. I sat down on my computer and uh, started typing on the keyboard on a Google search. I was confused and I was lost. And I typed in flashbacks, nightmare, anger, drugs, and I hit enter on a Google search and PTSD lit the screen up. I couldn't believe it. I've never been in the military. I thought PTSD was just for, just for military. I heard the letters. It's a military thing, I thought. When I opened up some of the sites, I realized that first responders, anybody can get PTSD. An eight-year-old kid can have PTSD. I realized there was help. There was, there was therapies, there was treatments. And when I seen the symptoms, it was, it was so amazing. When I seen the symptoms, it was like, that's me. I've got PTSD and I didn't even know what the letters stood for, post-traumatic stress disorder. I found out there was help. And I studied it all night on, on YouTube videos and Googled as much and, as much as I could about PTSD. And the next morning, eight o'clock in the morning, I went over to my ex-girlfriend's apartment and I knocked on the door and when she cracked it open, I barged in, I pushed the door open and I was, I was hollering. I said, I've got PTSD. It, you know, it was weird because I found the answer to what I had. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going crazy and there was help and I could get some help. And when I barged in there, the look on my face, I'm sure the passion on my face and no one what was wrong with me, was similar to the rage on my face and the anger on my face when I was yelling at him. She had my two sons behind her, backing down a hallway, with my two sons looking around her, scared to death of me. They thought I was there to physically hurt them. They thought I lost my mind. I left that place thinking I was, they were never going to trust me. They gave up. They were scared to death of me. I went back down to my shop and I had to, had to walk around the end of that desk and the gun was still laying there and the rounds were still laying there. And uh, it was really hard. It was really hard not to reach for that gun and load it because I figured it had to be a mistake. But that's when I noticed, and this is a revolver, that's when I noticed that uh, all six rounds, none of them had a dimple on them, but it clicked. And it gave me enough energy, enough of something to realize that there's a reason I'm here. And I sat down and started making phone calls. I had gathered some numbers over the years. I called a suicide hotline 12 times and nobody answered. I called three other phone numbers that were for firefighters that my chief gave me five years prior. Gave me these phone numbers. I asked him for, I asked him for some phone numbers I could call if I'm having some problems. He gave them to me. Five years later, I called those three phone numbers and they were all disconnected. They were no longer in service. I called a friend of mine that was a police officer and I told him that, uh, told him I just tried to kill myself and I need some help. I want you to go talk to, I found out I've got PTSD. I'm pretty sure I got it, you know. And I asked him if he'd go over and talk to my ex-girlfriend and my kids and explain what PTSD is. He said he was gonna come out pick me up, take me to the hospital, and they're gonna lock me up. That was not, that wasn't the answer I needed right then. I couldn't be caged up like an animal. I finally found out what was bothering me all those years, and the confusion I was going through was PTSD. I talked him out of not coming out and picking me up, and he said he'd stay away. When I hung the phone up, I went out into my shop, grabbed my acetylene tanks and my propane tanks, and this is how far gone I was. I lined them up in my shop, 
went back into my office, grabbed my SKS rifle, loaded it with tracer rounds, set it on the desk, and I have cameras on the outside of my repair shop, and I sat down and watched the monitors. I figured they were gonna send the police out for me, and they were not gonna lock me up. I was gonna blow myself up. I didn't do it to hurt the police. I wasn't thinking about that. I was not gonna be taken into a hospital. That's how far gone I was. I found out later that he heard the desperation in my voice and he stayed away. He actually called in three deputies to come to his office and he told them not to drive by the shop because he knew something wasn't right. He knew I had those cameras out there and he knew it wasn't gonna be good if they did drive by. And he had enough sense to know, you know, not to, not to come out and to trust me. I had two last phone numbers on my list that I told them I was going to call them. If they didn't answer, I'd call them back. The next number on my list was a phone number that was on, on our board, our whiteboard at the hall. They, uh, they put it up there about a year earlier and they said, if we have any, anything we need to talk about, to call this lady and she'll help us. Well, I called the number, got a hold of her, talked to her. And it was, a, it was fairly local, and I told her what happened. I said, I tried to kill myself, and I need help. She set me up with an appointment for a week and a half out. I hung the phone up, making that appointment. And I hung the phone up knowing I was going to be dead by sunset. There was no way I was going to make it through the day. The last number I had on the list was a number that my assistant chief at that time texted me and I don't know what he's seen, he's seen something and he texted me and or if I asked for help I, I really don't recall but he texted me the number to share the load program and I called it and when I called it it rang like twice and they answered I told them I said I'm, I tried to kill myself I need help I begged them and he said, Scott, we've got you. And it was like they reached through the phone and picked me up. They had me. They said, we're going to get through this together. We're here to help you. We're going to work through this together. They started, they, they talked me down. They got me calmed down. And they started talking about something called EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing. And I didn't really understand what they were talking about. It didn't make any sense what they were talking about. This EMDR sounded kind of like hypnotizing or almost like a witchcraft. And um, I listened and they helped me set up an appointment. And I called, made the appointment for the very next day. Um, and when I hung the phone up, I started doing research again. I mean, I was on meth, I wasn't sleeping anyways. I started doing research on EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Again, on Google searches and on YouTube, and I watched, and it really didn't make any sense how this stuff was going to help me. Um, and I don't get paid to talk about EMDR. I'm, so I'm not showing any favoritism towards any kind of treatment, but I went to the appointment the next day. I had to drive to Fargo for it, and it was about an hour drive, and it was very, very difficult to go that far. I went in, the first two sessions we talked. It was a counseling session basically, and they're trying to figure out what was causing me to be so angry and why I was like what I was. I was cold, I was numb, I didn't have any emotions anymore, I didn't care about anybody. I couldn't get close to anybody. And we actually thought that it was, uh, we kind of narrowed it down to where it was an ex-girlfriend that hurt me somewhere along the line. I blamed it on some ex-girlfriends. I said, okay, this has to be it. Well, when we uh, started the session, the third session, they put vibrating pads on the legs and they used this light bar that went across to the front of me. And we started talking and we started going back and I was trying to go back as far as I could to see, okay, which girl hurt me, you know, to where I was so cold that I don't care about people anymore. And all of a sudden, all hell busted loose. The stuff that I was trying to hide from and run from and not talk about came out the fatalities, the car accidents, the kids. I could see the faces of them. 
I could see the cars. I could smell the exhaust, the gas. I could hear the doors popping on the cars when we took them off. And I started talking about it. We never did debriefings. We never talked about it. Paid on call department, small department, we got back to the fire hall, put the truck away, and you'd be home half an hour, within half an hour after cutting a kid out of a car, playing with your own kids. It, it, it just, it, it doesn't work like that. We can't be doing that. We have to debrief, and we never did it on our fire department. Once I started talking about those accidents and getting the stuff out that I hid from all those years and I refused to talk about, something amazing started to happen. I had six sessions in a month's time. <clears throat> something really neat happened because I started to feel freedom and a peace. And I started to actually feel light. It was like the it was like I had a trench coat on that was covered with dry tar and really heavy. And it's like I peeled it off and I took it off and I just left it there. I can still remember the accidents. In fact, I remember them. I, I can recall them now. And it's okay. I, I can live with that. I knew it wasn't my fault. I, the stuff got tangled up in my head so bad that I was blaming myself and I was seeing things that really didn't happen. And I was blaming myself. I also started seeing it in color again. My world was dark, shady, lots of shadows, gray, dungy, cold. I could tell you what color something was, but I couldn't see it the way I see things like the, the colors I see now. It's amazing. When I was driving back from Fargo after these therapies, I was seeing things I never seen. I drove to Fargo all the time, and I used to, and I never noticed it. I never noticed people. I could never see, I could never see the good positive things in life. My life was so negative, and I started to get positive. When I went in for my first light session, what I call light session, it's not, I don't want to get confused with light therapy, but where they started doing the therapy on me with the, the vibrating pads, and it worked my mind back and forth, and it's like it put my mind in the REM mode of sleep, and let my subconscious come free, like my nightmares, but I was in control of them. But before the first session, I knew we were gonna do that. I did three huge lines of meth in the parking lot. And that's the three last three lines, that's the last lines of meth. That's the last time I ever had a craving for meth. I walked away from a cold turkey all by myself. My counselor didn't even know I was doing meth. He found out when I was three weeks clean, I came, came forward and told him about it. He got pretty pissed off about me not telling him, but um, you know, it, it's just to be able to walk away from meth. That was in August of 2014, and I haven't been angry since. I haven't had a nightmare since. And I haven't even thought about being on meth or doing meth. It's like it's a brand new life. I can see colors. In fact, I, uh, my sister, when she comes to visit, we go out for dinner, and so many times when we go out, she goes, don't do that thing you do, and it's like, what are you talking about? Well, you can't just walk up to people you don't know, women you don't know, and say, you're beautiful. You know, it's like, it just comes out now. I mean, I, I can lay on my picnic table and look up at the sky and look at the trees, and I can see them now, the different shades of every color. It, it's just amazing. I mean, the smile's back, my sense of humor's back. I love being around people. I don't like being at home alone. It's not like I'm insecure, it's just, man, I want, I want to be around people. Um, I can't shut up about this. Whatever happened that day changed me forever. It got me out of the dark, dungeon hell. And now I can't shut up about it. I don't want anybody going back. I'm not going back for sure, but I don't want anybody going to where I was. Especially when the, the resources are there. And we don't have to live with nightmares. We don't have to be angry. And well, reaching out for help was the best thing I ever did. I didn't have any health insurance. I didn't have any help from the city, from the fire department, nothing. It cost me $1,000 out of my own pocket. It's the best $1,000 I ever, ever spent for this therapy.
in uh, about two months after this happened, and after this July suicide attempt, I woke up with some heartburn and uh, told myself, I haven't seen a doctor for 10 years. I'm gonna go see a doctor. You know, maybe it's chest pains, all that meth I put in me. Man, all the stress, maybe there's something else. Never had heartburn before, so I really wasn't sure. Went in, walked into the clinic, and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having some chest pains. You know, I think it's just heartburn, but it's pretty amazing what happens when you walk into a clinic and tell them you're having chest pains. I had two gorgeous <laughs> gals come on, had me in a wheelchair, got me in the back room, tore my shirt off, put EKGs on me, and I'm like, man, I'm gonna do this every time to get service. <laughs> They couldn't find anything wrong in the EKGs and the heart and uh, x-ray, nothing was showing up. But they gave me nitroglycerin, nitro, and it, the chest pains went away. Then they got worried. They knew, I told them about the meth. They rushed me to Fargo. And um, they actually didn't need to rush me. The doctor said, you know, you don't need lights and sirens. Unfortunately, it was a firefighter that on my fire department that happened to be driving the ambulance. We made it 10 feet, lights and sirens went on, and we were doing 90 with a 50 mile per hour side wind, and, and my heart rate was really up when I got there. <laughs> they uh, ended up doing, doing an ultrasound in my heart, and they couldn't see anything, nothing was wrong. They said, it looks fine. In fact, it looked really healthy. And uh, I actually kept a video of that ultrasound for some ex-girlfriends of mine so I could show that I do have a heart. <laughs> um, but they, uh, they did a angiogram also. And I was laying on that, that x-ray table when they were doing the angiogram and they had all the stents laid out and all the, everything and they told me, hey, we're, if we find something, we've got to go in. And they were really worried about the, about the PTSD, the stress, and all the meth I did. I did about a bowling ball size of meth. And I, I knew that had to do damage to me. And I didn't, I didn't know for sure I was leaving that hospital alive. When they did the angiogram, they got in, and the guy in, on the speakers goes, hey, stop, back it up. He goes, is that a bridge? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm dead. <laughs> they found a myocardial bridge in my heart, something that's gonna give me chest pains, but I can live with it. It's not, it's not nothing serious. It's just some arteries or something in the heart that overcross each other, and it's nothing serious. I'll be fine. They cannot understand how I could do that much meth and not have damage to my heart. They said it's super strong. Three months after that, I went in because I was bleeding. And I've been bleeding for years because I snorted all this meth. And it got into my stomach, it got into my, my intestines and my throat and I was bleeding. So they uh, did a GI and they uh, asked me if I wanted to do a colonoscopy at the same time because they were gonna knock me out. And I was 46 years old at this time. And he said, you don't have to do it until you're 50. You know, that's when we recommend it. But of course, you know, once they offered it, I jumped up and said, yeah, it sounds like a blast. Let's do it. <laughs> and I didn't really do that, but um, went through the process, got all cleaned out. They went to knock me out and I made them promise that if they're using the same scope to go down the top first. <laughs> and when I woke up, they said that they found the damage to my stomach. And they said it was healing already. They said they could tell I stopped the meth. And there's no permanent damage, it'll take care of itself. A week later, when I went in for the colonoscopy results, the doctor walked into the room, and at 46 years old, he, t he held his hand out and said, congratulations, you're a colon cancer survivor. They took out five polyps and two of them were cancerous, and they were going into, the can into my colon. And they got them in time. They said if I'd waited until I was 50, it'd been too late. There's no cancer in my family. This business is serious. We have heart issues, we have cancer, and mental health. And the mental health is the one we can, it's, it's been swept under the rug, all three of them have. When I went and talked to my firefighters and took a leave of absence, told them, I had PTSD and I told them I tried to commit suicide. I trained a lot of these firefighters in auto extrication and the room went silent. 
I could literally see the tears <coughs> in front of the guy next to me, hitting the table. He couldn't believe what I was saying. And I begged him, I said, you guys have to please, I'm gonna take a leave of absence for a little bit, but please don't leave me in that house alone. Come take me fishing, take me hunting, get me out of brown people, don't leave me alone. And they treated me like I had the plague. They didn't know what to say. They weren't educated about PTSD. They didn't know themselves. They didn't want to say something that would put me over the edge. I needed their help. Any one of us can get PTSD. It doesn't discriminate. With different backgrounds, different, different childhoods, things that happen to us outside of the fire department too can affect it. We're not superheroes. This macho thing has to stop. I'm a better person now than I've ever been in my life. I mean, people say, how can you stand there with tears in your eyes and say you're strong? Well, I haven't forgot how to fight either, but I just choose not to. I'm in New York, talking to New York firefighters about emotions and love. Holy buckets, never thought I'd be doing this. You know, I never felt this good. To be able to be free and, and to live again without the nightmares, the blame. I had a fire chief tell me after I got done speaking one time, to not let anybody tell you, tell, tell anybody that lightning doesn't strike twice and that this doesn't affect us all. He had two firefighters kill themselves. He was chief had two firefighters commit suicide before he opened his eyes up. And he told me that the guilt he's living with now for not doing something earlier is eating him up. It's too late when somebody kills themselves. There's more firefighters killing themselves than dying a line of duty deaths right now. It doesn't need to happen. We have to watch out for each other, reach out for each other, watch for the symptoms. If your spouse says, hey, you're changing, listen, they're gonna be the ones that see it first. My, my ex-girlfriend went to all the firefighters. A lot of the spouses, my entire family said, Scott's yelling at us. He's out of control. At home, he's yelling at us and nobody believed him, believed her. I had to hit that well, but all the signs were there. When I showed up to one car accident in my own vehicle, I got, out of my vehicle, went up to the scene, it was bad. First truck rolled in, I met him halfway. I said, you guys don't need to go any farther. I'll take care of this one. I'm already damaged, you don't need to go any farther. I told him I was damaged. I don't even remember saying it, but three firefighters came up to me after this and said, we should have seen the signs. We went from assistant chief down to nothing. Not making meetings, not making trainings, not showing up for fire calls. The signs are all there. We've got to watch out for each other. It's a dangerous business. We're human. Don't close the emotions out. Don't get numb. Don't set the, put the walls up. You know, I'm 49 years old. At 46 years old, after this therapy, I tried to jump a picnic table. Like I did when I was 18 years old. I used to do it when I was 18 years old. I tried to do it at 46 years old. It didn't work so good. My sons were there. I sort of, I mean, I made it over. I just didn't make it on my feet. Two weeks later, I stretched out and I jumped that picnic table. That's how good I feel. It's dangerous feeling like you're 20 years old with a body that's 49. You wake up pretty sore and you go out dancing and it's like, oh man, I can't be doing this all night. <laughs> but it's amazing. I mean, my, my ice melts in my drinks. I still drink alcohol, but it's different. I don't sit there and get drunk. I don't get hammered. And it feels good. It feels awesome being alive. I never thought I'd be going around the country doing this. I'm not a mechanic anymore. I can't even fix my own cars. And I'm okay with that. Something else happened because I'm never nervous when I'm up in front of people. I just want to make sure, if you take anything out of this, make sure you guys take care of yourselves and the firefighters and people around you. We're human.
Thank you, Scott. I mean, it's a, as you all know, that wasn't easy to do. The first time I heard it, uh, and I was part of the process. Uh, last, last year I received 848 calls. I received calls from everything with, uh, well, you know, I've been drinking a little bit, the wife's mad, to last week, I had a girl from Florida call who was absolutely, un I could not stop her from screaming crying. Uh, no alcohol involved, no drugs involved. Her life is completely unraveling. It took me 20 minutes just to get her to the point that she could talk to me. That's what's going out there. During the opening today, I happened to be standing on the side over here getting some technical stuff done. And one of the chiefs up here was speaking about United States veterans. 22 to 25 veterans a day in this country are killing themselves. What jobs do the veterans usually go for when they come out of the service? Police department, fire department, EMS. And before I forget, being I just took them out and carried them all the way over here, there's posters here with Scott's picture on them. Uh, you're welcome to bring, take as many as you need for your firehouse. If you need more, our booth is 3135. It's up by the front doors, uh, upstairs in the, uh, in the conference center. Uh, and we'll have more there. Uh, put them in your firehouses. It's completely free. Like I said, when they dial that number, my phone rings. All right, so we talked about EMDR, eye motion desensitization and reprocessing. The thing I like about EMDR, and I'm not a medical doctor, is that there's no drugs involved. Uh, you went to a therapist's office, it's done with, with uh, flashing lights, and uh, it, it deals with rapid eye movement. Uh, I've been doing this hotline for over four years. I have never had a call saying this was bad. And you know the fire service. If there's a call, something to say bad, you'll get 45 calls. Never once did I get a call. Uh, Scott, also being from Frazee, Minnesota, and being in New York, this morning was great. My son Sean and I were sitting, sitting in the, down in the hotel at the breakfast area, and Scott walked up and he said, what is it with crosswalks in New York? I said, when you're on a crosswalk in New York, you're a target. <laughs> He's from crazy Minnesota where they, you're going to crosswalk, the cars stop. And I go, around the, I go around the country saying, why are these cars stopping? And in the meantime, I'm running across the street. So EMDR stands for eye motion desensitization reprocessing, a relatively new therapy that research has shown to be effective in reducing the symptoms of PTSD. It works by having the patient recount the trauma experienced in detail while moving his eyes back and forth in a clockwise fashion. Uh, the jury's still out on it. I can tell over the phone when somebody that I've been talking to who suffered from PTSD has already been to a doctor. I can hear it in their voice when they're on anti-anxiety or anti-depression medication. Uh, again, I'm not a doctor, but uh, I think it's much better to head towards something that does not add drugs to the, to the equation. Line of duty death fires. Uh, people don't realize that are, people that are not in the fire service do not realize that when when six firefighters were killed in Worcester, Massachusetts, and nine firefighters were killed in Charleston, South Carolina, that every firefighter in this country felt it. Uh, July 1st, 1988, when five firefighters were killed in Hackensack Fort. How many times did we watch those videos? How many times do, did we think that could be us? And, and due to their loss of life, you know, we used that to, to, to uh, train and to better ourselves and to make sure that it didn't happen again. Um, but these things hit us. How do you think the guys in Charleston felt? How do you think the guys in Worcester felt? 9-11, 343 firefighters died that day and are still dying today. Uh, it all has to, it also, all has to catch up with us somewhere. 
This is Paul Combs' famous illustration. You know, I've, I've been thinking about, about suicide. Please help. It's not something we discuss. We come back to the firehouse. Uh, like I said before, get the rigs back in shape because two minutes after we get back, we could be heading out the door again. You know, maybe sit around and have a cup of coffee, like I said, maybe a couple of beers or something like that. And, and, and uh, nobody says what's going on inside them. Nobody says, you know, I'm scared to death. Because we don't do that in fire service. We're Superman. There's a chief, his name is Pat Kenny from Northern Illinois, whose son was clinically depressed from the time he was five years old. And like he says, he says, I didn't know that you could be clinically depressed at five years old, but the doctor said he was. Uh, finally, at 20 years old, his son took his own life. And afterwards, you know, the guys from the firehouse and the department got together and said, Chief, we didn't know this was going on. For 15 years, he never said a word in the firehouse about what was going on in his family. We don't do that. We put on the red cape, and we're the, we're the rescuers. We're not the rescue. So what we do is we keep stuffing it down and we wind up dying from the very thing, for, for doing the very thing that uh, saves others' lives. <clears throat> we go in one direction. Okay, so the national averages, each year 42,773 Americans die by suicide. In 2015, every one of these 116 uh, firefighters were investigated by a, a gentleman named Jeff Dill, who I'll get into a little bit in, in a minute. So 116 took their own lives. I believe in 2015, 84 died in the line of duty. In the first six months of 2015, 130 active duty uh, troops took their own lives and the uh, approximately 102 law enforcement officers committed suicide in 2015. Firefighters Behavioral Health Alliance. Along the way, I've been making relationships with, uh, with other people in this, in this business. And I ran into a guy named Jeff Dill, who was from the Palatine uh, Fire District, which is just outside of uh, Chicago, Illinois. Jeff. Jeff has such a compassion for this that when he was, when he was, uh, he had been promoted to assistant chief. And anybody who's been in any type of civil service, when you're promoted to Monday to Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and holidays off, you've just hit the lottery. Jeff was so committed to get the message out on firefighter behavioral health that he dropped down, back down to captain so that he could go back on the chart and work mutuals so that he could travel the country and, and do, uh, do uh, uh, more, for his, uh, more for his brothers and sisters. This is his information. Uh, like I said, I, I talk to Jeff once a week. He does a great job. Now here's somebody you all know. I grabbed him at FDIC one day and I said, listen, could you say a couple of words about firefighter behavior health? And this guy always has a couple words to say about everything. I was a company officer for uh, a long time. I was Lieutenant Squad 1 in Brooklyn, Captain of 48 Engine, uh, and I had a, a cast of characters. And, and, and in the fire service, obviously drinking is, is one of the problems. You know, a guy that just looks a little bit off and you talk to him, yeah, I had a party today, but I haven't had a drink in about three hours, to the guy that stumbles in, you know. So uh, in the old days, we used to just sort of, you know, put him to bed or whatever and, and, and deal with it. But, uh, but, but a couple of guys in my time on a job had, had bigger problems where maybe somebody come up to you and say, hey, Cap, what's going on with Billy? And they would tell me about it. And, you know, I would call them into the office and talk to them about stuff. Almost almost every time, the first meeting, was the first discussion was very short. Cap, I'm good. I don't know where you got that, but, you know, and they would leave. But, you know, subsequent conversations usually led to a discussion. And I was just gave them my personal story. Not my whole little crappy story, but... You know, look, if you need some help or if you need a cutting down, maybe my experience with, with my family, you know, and tell guys the problems that they can encounter and the things that they could lose, like jobs and careers and pensions and stuff like that, you know. Well, I guess when you say dealing with an impaired member, I guess there's a couple of different one ways is dealing with an impaired member, you know, on duty or in the firehouse or even maybe at the company party. 
And I always tell guys to make sure you make sure you maintain whoever it is you're dealing with, you maintain their integrity and their privacy. You never you know, you're already not supposed to discipline people in public already. That's a pretty good rule. I always tell guys, make sure you do everything privately and some guys got got a pretty big stature in the firehouse and, and the fact that they might have a problem that you try and help them with, you don't wanna you don't wanna to blow that that privacy thing, you know? Uh, the other thing was I've had guys with problems at home. You know, I've had guys with problems at home, you know, drinking problems at home. They, they never had problems in the firehouse, but they had problems at home that I found out through other guys. And I always dealt with it, like I said, up in the office privately or at a social function privately. And and then, of course, referral. You know, luckily the FDMY has, you know, constant service unit. We're all heroes, you know, we're all heroes, we're all strong guys, we're all tough guys. Everybody I ever met in the fire service was a tough guy, you know, including me. And guys don't want to admit problems, guys don't want to look weak. And, and, I'm, not, and I'm not saying problems or having these problems is weakness, it's just, it's just, we're told by everybody, especially here. You come to a show like this, you guys are special, we're the bravest, everything else. We put ourselves on a pedestal, we put each other on a pedestal. Pretty hard for a guy on a pedestal to come into an office and say, oh man, I'm, I'm messed up, I need help, you know? So I think that's probably, probably the biggest problem. You know, I teach a lot of leadership around the country, and I think the same piece of advice, uh, lead by example, you know? Having been through it myself, a lot of times I would just eventually get get to a guy and say, listen, fix your thinking by yourself. <laughs> You're not. Guys like me, guys like friends I know, I've mentioned, mentioned other guys whose, whose names are out there, you know, and say, if, if you got something to deal with, if you got a problem that you're having trouble dealing with, know that other people have been down that road way ahead of you, and you can always talk to them about it, get some advice. And of course, to what I said about the last question, referrals. Tell them, you know what, take this card, call this guy up, call this guy Mike, call this guy Joe, and you know what, you'll be amazed at what they can, what they can tell you. Just real quick to go over, to go over quick, alcohol, socially acceptable, and absolutely a tradition in the fire service. I joined the Baldwell Volunteer Fire Service in 1970. I helped them out with a little bit of a brush fire, I helped them pack hose, they invited me down. You know the deal. Here's, here's an application, and let me show you this room in the back. We walked to the room, there was a steel door, it said, it said uh, transformer room. So what are these guys going to show me, they were electrical room? They opened up the door and there was a big, beautiful bar. The Oak Cathedral, we used to call it. Uh, in any case, uh, many drinkers have no abuse problems. This isn't a, not, uh, a, a stop drinking program. This is uh, where you get help if you think you need to stop. Uh, many drink for years with no problems, only to have them appear, uh, whoop, only to have them appear later in life. That's where I think the PTSD may be working in. They never had a drinking problem, nothing ever went wrong. All of a sudden, they're starting to self-medicate because of the PTSD. Opiates, absolute epidemic in this country. It's in the papers every day. Firefighters are not, uh, not uh, are susceptible to it also, especially if they get injured. I get calls all the time. I hurt my back. I was, I was pulling a roof, uh, did something on my back, went to the doctor. If you get, go to the doctor, what's he going to give you? Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, Oxycontin. Uh, Start taking them, start taking more than, you, uh, than you're supposed to be taking. Now he won't give you any more. Buy them on the street, it's about $50 a pill, and a bag of heroin is $5. And if you don't think there's firemen in some of your own firehouses snorting and shooting heroin, you're very, you'd be very surprised. Especially if you sat and listened to some of the calls I get. Adderall and cocaine. Uh, it's used to make you feel better. Alcohol's helper. You know, when a guy's having a serious enough problem that he can't drink, sometimes he, he has two drinks and, he, and he's drunk, and sometimes he has 40 and can't get, and can't get drunk. Uh, Adderall and, and, uh, and alcohol, uh, and they're also being used together with opiates. So you have somebody who's nodding out with their eyes rolling back in the head, and then talking like uh, you beg them to shut up. The news media circus. If I work down at the shop right and I have an automobile accident and kill somebody when I'm drunk, what's it say? Local man arrested. If we do it, what's it say? Firefighter arrested. Right? They put that right out there. Here's the guy who's supposed to be saving you, and he's the guy who, who just killed you. All right, department SOPs and policies. You gotta have a game plan. You gotta have a game plan. 
what's going to happen, uh, we talked about this morning, our trucks are all over 27,000 pounds, meaning they're rated as what? You need a CDL license to do it, but in the state of New York, we don't need that license. But if you get tested, you get tested under CDL limits, which would mean 0 .04, which means if you walk by a bar, you're probably 0 .04. Uh, so, uh, if you go out, what happens? What are you going to do if, if one of your firefighters is sitting in that bar in your firehouse, and we all have them, and he's having a couple of beers, and the alarm comes in, and he jumps in the rig. Now he goes out, he runs through a light, kills a family. What, what's your plan? What's on paper? Uh, what's your game plan when somebody walks up to you and says, I have a serious problem? I have a problem with alcohol, I have a problem with opiates. Do you have a game plan? Uh, here's a guy that you've taken on, into the department, you've, you've equipped him, you've trained him and everything else, what are you gonna kick him out the door? We're supposed to be there to help our brothers and sisters. You gotta have something on paper and some sort of plan to do something if something goes wrong. What about the firefighter's family? How about this one? And this is from when I worked in the transit authority, he wasn't a fireman, but he walked in and he said, uh, my wife was cleaning out uh, my daughter's drawer yesterday in her chest of drawers, and she found these, and he held out five uh, hypodermic needles. His 15-year-old daughter was shooting heroin. Okay, it, it, you're, you're gonna lose that firefighter because he's gonna be absolutely useless to you. It would be nice to have some sort of plan to, to action we do. We ha we'll handle problems with, uh, with the family members too. Okay, most lawyers departments have, have uh, counseling units or member assistance programs. Um, most suffering from a multitude of problems that can find help through the, these units. Volunteer in small departments, small careers departments usually don't have a program. Like I said, take these, take uh, one of these posters, put them up in your firehouse. Uh, it doesn't cost a dime to use the service. Uh, types of help that are available are crisis intervention, assessment and referral, help for family members, substance abuse, and, uh, and mental health concerns. And there's, there's no cost for our, for our service. Uh, again, here's the number. Uh, we're in booth 3135 at the American Addiction Center's booth upstairs. Uh, Scott will be with me and, uh, and uh, we'll be here for the rest. And I actually did that in 62 minutes. With that, I'd like to, th I'd like to thank Scott and, and I'd like to thank you for coming out to this presentation and I uh, hope you have a good conference. Thank you.